evening, everybody. Welcome to week four of the Bible Masterclass. Let me pray and we're going to jump in. Father, we are grateful for what you want to teach us tonight in your word, what you want to reveal to us, what you want to show us through your prophets and through the writings, Lord. We just pray that our eyes would be opened and our ears would be opened. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, a lot of content. I am distilling it down. I, I, I could camp out here. Each, each one of the items that I'm going to be dealing with today are at least a 20-week course by themselves. I'm combining them, so that means stuff has to go. That means I had to put some stuff on the cutting floor and some stuff had to go. So understand that this is an overview of the prophets and the writing. This is an overview because there are 39 total books in the Old Testament. We dealt with five last week. That means we're dealing with, you got it, 34 this week. So that's why I said this is going to be broad stroke overview so that we can dive into as much as we can. We're going to begin with the prophets, the Nevi'im, the prophets. Now, the Hebrew Bible divides up the section of the prophets into two sections, the former prophets and the latter prophets. The former prophets include Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, while the latter prophets contain most of the books that you would recognize as the prophetic books, i.e. the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the minor prophets, known as the book of the twelve, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. <laughs> Let me summarize again. Old Testament prophets, Nevi'im, broken into former prophets and latter prophets. The former prophets are Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, and 1st, 2nd Kings. And then the latter prophets, if you just want to write down in your notes for the latter prophets, major and minor prophets. That's how they're divided, the major and the minor prophets. We're just going to deal here with the prophets, the Nevi'im, that's the Hebrew term. Former and latter. find that repetition is very helpful to understanding. The former and the latter, and the latter are broken up into the major and the minor. Now, there are a number of types of prophets. So there are types of prophets in the Old Testament. The prophets are not like the priests. The priests are a hereditary class who serve God. You have to be of a certain tribe. The prophets are not a hereditary calling of based on what tribe you're in, but it, it, some prophets would serve for the entirety of their life while other prophets would serve for a season. And they would be finished with their prophetic role and live their life as they had done previously. In the types of prophets, I want to talk about three specifically. The first are royal court prophets. Royal court prophets. They were associated with and normally employed by the royal court, the king. They would live in the palace or have proximity to the king. And they would minister the prophetic message under the hiring or leadership of the king. This would be, uh, some, some good examples of this are the prophet Nathan, and the prophet Gad during David's rule. They were stationed right near him and had access to his courtroom. These were royal court prophets in the Old Testament. There were the second type of prophets are cultic prophets. What do I mean by cultic? I mean these prophets were involved in and close to the religious sites of worship. 
the religious cultic practices, not in the sense of they were a cult, but in the sense that they had practices. I've got my wires tangled up here, so just give me a moment. I'm twisting. I'm, I'm having a free chiropractic session here from the wires. So, The cultic prophets were close to a religious cultic site and ministered alongside the priests. So an example of this would be Habakkuk or Isaiah. Habakkuk and Isaiah were ministering alongside the priests in proximity to the temple. That's why Isaiah had a vision in the temple, Isaiah 6, and the train of his robe filled the temple. He's ministering in proximity to the temple, the cultic practices, the sacrifices, the, the worship of Yahweh, that system. And then the third is a free or independent prophet. These might be my favorite, <laughs> the free or independent prophets. This is Elijah. Elijah, who's definitely not employed by the king, Ahab. He's definitely not employed in any way by uh, the king's groups. He's not connected to the... He's often in caves. He's often in other places hiding away from the threat of the palace. And, and the free or independent prophets do not give messages that the palace likes. They're not hired by the government. So they say, in fact, many times the opposite of what the government wants to hear. They say things that upsets the kings and the uh, and the governmental leaders. They say, bring us these prophets who tickle our ears, and then they bring in some, and they say, well, this one only gives bad news. So if you bring him in, he's just going to be a bad news prophet. These are not employed by the government, and Elijah is kind of the archetype of a free or independent prophet who's just kind of roaming the land. He's living wherever. He's traveling. He's itinerant in nature. He's going to a number of different places, and he doesn't have just one site of employment. He just goes wherever Yahweh leads him. These are free and independent prophets. Let me give you some definitions. In the prophets, that's the section we, we dealt with Torah. The Hebrews call it the Tanakh. Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. Just kind of a, a phrase, the Tanakh, that helps them remember those three different portions in the Hebrew Bible. We're dealing with the prophets or the Nevi'im, former and latter prophets. But here's some definitions that you're going to see in, or some terms you're going to see in the Old Testament prophets. You're going to hear about a seer, one who has extraordinary insight into the plans and purposes and will and activity of God a seer, one who can see beyond what is happening naturally and perceive divine realities, supernatural purposes and desires. Another term you're going to see in its own right is a visionary. This does not, in the contemporary sense of the word, like being a visionary leader, but Visionary experiencing supernatural visions or dreams often. Somebody like a Daniel would be a visionary. Somebody who's experiencing high levels of revelation as a result of visions and dreams. You'll see this term often. Man of God. I love that. It's normally capitalized when The man of God, call for the man of God. Bring the man of God. Get the man of God here. I, my, my son is sick. Bring, call for the man of God. The man of God is a, a, a term that's used to describe somebody who's divinely called and empowered by God for ministry. Particularly in the prophets, it describes somebody who's close to God, close to his thoughts, close to his words. And the fourth term you're going to see a lot is prophet. 
shocking in the prophets. You see the word prophet a lot. The term literally means one who's divinely called to speak on behalf of a deity. So if you have the prophets of Baal, that means that they have been called to speak on behalf of Baal. The prophets of God, of Yahweh, have been called to speak on behalf of Yahweh. There is a difference between the classes of ministry and the roles of ministry. A prophet is listening for the voice of God and speaking to the people on behalf of God. A priest is listening to the voice of his people and interceding on behalf of his people to God for the people. So the roles are like this. The prophet's this way, the priest is this way. Those were the roles that they played in the prophetic literature. Now these are definitions you'll find. Here's function. The prophets had two primary functions. Number one, forth telling. Forth telling. That means to proclaim to announce, to preach, to speak divine messages from God to people. This is a thus saith the Lord type word where the prophets are saying, this is the message of God to you for your life and its application here and now. All prophecy is not future oriented. Sometimes it's just proclamation of God's thoughts, his mind, and his heart. There is a second function, though, and it is foretelling. That is to predict future events. And the prophets are full of events that, hey, go ahead and run down and tell Ahab to prepare for rain. It's coming. Well, that's foretelling. It's not raining. There's a cloud the size of a man's hand. He's foretelling something, and he's prophesying into the future. Foretelling. And foretelling, there's a great example. When Elisha gives commands to the king to strike the ground, he's giving a message from God. He says, open the window, take the bow, stretch the, put the arrow in the bow, release the arrow, then strike the ground with the arrow. And he's telling him what God's saying. And then, once he does, doesn't fully obey the word of the Lord from Elisha and doesn't continue to strike the ground but stops, there is a foretelling that takes place. Hey, because you only struck the ground three times instead of five or six, you'll only have partial vi victory over Syria three times. That's foretelling. That's information that has not yet occurred, but that will occur. Forthtelling and foretelling. That's an important note. Not just in Old Testament, but New Testament as well. All prophecy is not predictive. Some of it's, here's something important to know. A lot of times preaching is prophecy. In fact, a Sunday morning message has a strong prophetic edge to it. If the pastor has been hearing from God in the week, if not, it has zero prophetic edge to it. But that, that is the kind of message, and see, we just kind of discount that as just something to feed me, but there's actually a strong sense in that the ministry of the prophets in the Old Testament would be an explanation of the text in the Old Testament. I'm going to get into that. A message about it. Let me tell you some theological themes. Again, I, I'm dealing with over 20 books here in, in 30 minutes, so... These are broad stroke overviews. Let's talk about some theological themes. Number one, Yahweh's uniqueness. Amongst all other deities, His uniqueness, His superiority, His omnipotence. This is exactly what Elijah did when he confronted the prophets of Baal. 
Go ahead, dance, cut yourself. Your gods are probably going to the bathroom right now. Dance wilder, act crazier. Maybe they'll look at you. And, and then for Yahweh, he's like, all right, we're going to start a fire. Let's pour some water on it. Do you know what kind of level of taunting that is? Hey, somebody get the river and open it up and pour it out. We're going to start a fire. I mean, this is the level that he's trying to show how supreme Yahweh is compared to this so-called deity, Baal. He enacts this, this, almost this mocking of Baal to show how much more powerful, how much more authority, how unique the one true God is. This is what Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, the prophets did over and over and over again. There's no God like Yahweh. There's none like Him. All these other gods are false and not real. There's only one true God. He is supreme. He is different in His ethics than all the other gods. He is ethically superior. He's morally superior. His people are, are, are representing what he represents, and therefore, theme number two that is again and again in the prophets are the Jews' uniqueness. The Jews' uniqueness. They are different from every other people group. They are God's chosen people. There's a, there's a great movement happening in our world today called replacement theology that's absolutely bonkers, which says that now the New Testament people of God have replaced the Jewish people as God's people, and the Jewish people are no longer His chosen people, but only Christians. Well, Clearly, Romans 9 through 11 has never been read for people who have replacement theology, which says we are the ones who are grafted into the Jews, and just as easy as we were grafted in, we can be taken out. We have to understand in the Old Testament prophets the Jews' uniqueness. You also have to understand that it was always God's intent for the Jewish people to be a blessing to the nations and to be a light to the Gentiles. They failed in fulfilling what Christ came to fulfill. As God's Son and His people, Israel, they failed to be the light to the Gentiles. So who did He send? His only begotten Son. This is what was so difficult for the religious leaders. They were saying, we are God's Son. We are God's child. We are called to be the light to the Gentiles. But they failed in their mission in that, and God sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, to be successful, to be the light to the Gentiles, to graft them in, and to fulfill what Israel was always intended to fulfill, but failed in fulfilling. Amos 3, 2 is, is quite humorous, and if you're a, a parent or aspire to be one, just file this away. Amos 3, 2. This is God speaking to the Jewish people, you only have I known. That means have I especially entered into relationship with of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. That's just fantastic for parenting right there. You only have I known. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Only a parent has the right to discipline in their child. And what God is saying to the Jewish people in, in through Amos' prophetic ministry is, you're my child, you've stepped away from what I've called, therefore I am put in a place of disciplining you as a result of that. Because we have a unique relationship that's different from me from the Persians or me from the Egyptians or me and the Babylonians. I've specifically and specially chosen and elected Israel. Isaiah 43, 10 through 13, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, that, I may know and, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed. I am the Lord, and besides me there's no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaim. There was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses. I am God. Henceforth I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work and 
can turn it back. The Jews are God's unique people who he works through in his plans and purposes for. And the prophets reveal that over and over again, that Yahweh is different from any other God, and the Jews are different than any other people in the earth. The third theme I want to address is faithfulness to Torah. Faithfulness to Torah as a covenant requirement. I have a treat on the back side of this board for you all that's been prepared for you. I've prepared something for you, but I can't flip the board yet. Just know in the spirit that there's something incredible coming here in a moment. Okay. So, faithfulness to Torah as a covenant requirement for the Jews. The prophets were God's covenant mediators. They were the Torah obedience enforcers. They were, in a sense, God's policemen. They were enforcing the law, theologically, spiritually speaking. They were enforcing the law. The law. The prophets would take... Now, if, if you want to understand the prophetic writings in the Old Testament, this is one of the keys. The prophets are deeply concerned with Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the law of Moses, books of Moses, Pentateuch. They are supremely concerned with Torah and how it is being obeyed or disobeyed and what that means for people. That is the message of the prophets. This is Torah. This is what you're doing. Close the gap or judgment's coming. This is what God has instructed. This is where you're at. We've got to get alignment or judgment's coming. Every prophetic book, gonna, you're going to find that. Every prophetic book. So if you've never understood the prophets or what they're talking about or what it means, that is the key that will unlock understanding. Think of the prophets as having some kind of legal document, i.e. Torah. And they're looking at people who are breaking said legal document. And they know that there are consequences for breaking said legal document. So they go and try to warn and tell them not to break legal document or else consequences are coming. That's the prophet. Over and over and over and over, former, latter, major, minor, over, over and over again. The Hebrew people have fallen short. They have neglected justice. They have neglected the peoples that they were intended to reach and be a light to. And instead have adopted their false gods rather than being a light to them. God's purposes and intents were not being fulfilled in the way that he desired through his chosen vessel Israel. So the prophets are announcing warnings of impending judgment if we do not get into agreement with the covenant that we have agreed to, Exodus 24 covenant ratification ceremony, where they stood at the foot of the mountain and entered into covenantal agreement with Yahweh and said, we will obey this and you will be our God. They started moving away from that. Prophets are heralding a return to Torah. Torah was supposed to help them look more like Yahweh and reflect Him in the earth. And the more they moved away from Torah, the more they did not look like Yahweh. And the less effective they were as evangelists to the nations. Therefore, God said, I'm going to have to punish you because you're my unique children. And as your father, as your God, I have the right in our covenant agreement. I told you. I entered into an agreement with you in Deuteronomy 28 through 31 and told you what would happen if you were faithful to Torah. And I told you every single thing that would happen if you weren't. I told you your land would be taken away. 
Your towns would be burned up. Your temples would be burned down. You'd be dragged off in chains into foreign lands you did not know by people with strange tongues that you've never heard their languages. God told them all that in Deuteronomy 28 through 31. And the prophets were just the people trying to say that. But guess what? The people to the prophets did exactly what they do to pastors today. Why you got to be so judgmental and mean? Why you got to say stuff like that? Why, don't you care about people? And the prophets are saying, yes, we care about people. That's why we're trying to get them to obey Torah. If they don't, they're going to get dragged off into Babylon and killed. Yes, we deeply care. So this is the message of the prophets. Let me, let me give you some examples of how God is dealing with the Hebrew people in the prophets. You can write this verse down. This is in connection to point three, Amos 5, 21 through 24. How would you like preaching this message? Imagine I got up Sunday and I preach this message. I hate, I despise your feasts. What if I said, I hate when you come in on Sundays. God hates it. It's despicable to him. You would think I am the most cruel and mean-hearted person who would ever live. I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. The peace offerings, I will not look on them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. Stop singing. Take away from me the melody of your harps. I'm not listening. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Micah 6, 6 through 8. What is it that the Lord requires? He's told you what is good and what He requires to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God. The prophets were trying to get the Hebrew people to understand that faithfulness to Torah is a covenant requirement. It's not a suggestion. And if you don't do it, because of the agreement in covenant we entered into, there are consequences. Okay, those are some theological themes that you're going to see in the former, in the latter, in the major, and in the minor prophets. Let me tell you about, I'm going to erase some things. We're going to come over here. You can write this down before I write it. Prophetic theology of human history. I'll just condense it and say prophetic theology in human history. There are two things that God reveals through the prophets. Number one, human history is the arena, context, plane. We'll just stick with context and arena. That's enough. We don't have to keep adding synonyms. That human history is the arena or context of divine revelation. That's what the prophets are saying. God's not sending messages to Jupiter that have nothing to do with us. He's not sending these prophetic words to a moon floating around Saturn. He's sending them in the context of human history. He's sending them to people to hear, listen, and obey. And he's doing it through deeds or acts and words. He's performing miracles. He's splitting seas. He's raining down food from heaven. He's turning water into blood. He's calling forth water to flow out of rocks to, to help give water to over a million people. Human history is the arena in which God is working. 
He's doing that through actions and deeds, but he's also doing that through words. He's saying something. He's announcing messages. He's giving prophetic utterances. He's unique amongst the deities. He's calling people to faithfulness through his word that he's given. He's revealing himself in human history through deeds and words. Human history is the locale or the context of God's revelation. And in that, he's doing it through deeds and he's doing it in words. It's also important to note that human history is under divine control. And that Yahweh is sovereign. Human history is under divine control. The movements of human history are happening as a result of divine sovereignty. Yahweh's divine control, His plan. He's not taken off guard by events that are taking place in the world. They are happening under His sovereignty and His control. That does not mean that God is bringing about these things. It means that nothing can happen in the earth that is outside of his control that he cannot manage, steer, drive, and bring unto the ultimate fulfillment of his plans and his purposes. Prophetic theology. This is what the prophets are saying over and over and over again in a million different ways. The second thing that the prophets teach us in a theological sense is not just that human history is the arena of divine revelation, but human history is not cyclical. It is linear. Human history is not pointless circles where we're trapped in the same thing. Human history is linear moving toward God's plans and purposes. And when I flip this board over, your mind's going to flip over and you're going to see what I'm talking about when I mean that human history is linear and not cyclical. Yahweh is guiding, leading, directing, and moving it toward a final goal. And that final goal is the full establishment of His kingdom in the earth. You have to understand kingdom theology was intended for and was about, this is so significant, it's the kingdom. Do you understand that the kingdom in the Old Testament was supposed to be a a demonstration or a sign of the kingdom of God? In the same way that the kingdom of Israel with the king that was established was there, that's how it was supposed to look. It was supposed to be a type of the coming kingdom. But they failed when they moved away from faithfulness to God through commitment to Torah. Human history is going somewhere. It's not just random. It's not just a cycle. It is linear and it is moving. Okay, let me erase some stuff. I'm just going to have to get over my little black dots over here. So if it bothers any of you, it bothers me much greater, at a much greater level. But we're all going to make it in Jesus' name. (laughs) Does anybody else get bothered by that, or is it just me? All right. I'm the only one who likes a clean slate then. Nothing like a clean slate. Okay. And again, I can't flip this board because there's too much goodness on the other side to erase. It'd take me 30 minutes to redo what I've got on there. Let me tell you some major types and genres of prophetic literature. Major types or genres. There are five. I'm only going to deal with two. 
kind of one, but it has two parts. Again, it's a 90 minutes. This is a 20 to 30 week course, easy. Major and minor prophets are a course in and of themselves, former prophets. I mean, this is a year's worth, easy, easy, easy. So we're just condensing, we're hitting high points, giving overview in this master class. We have the first type is oracle. Let's make it plural, oracles or speeches. You're going to see this over and over again. Oracles, messages from God. Not just prophets saying some kind of thing that sounds kind of good. These are messages from God. This is a major type. Thus saith the Lord. Number one. Two. Visions. There are all kinds of visions in the prophetic literature. All kinds. Visions pepper the pages of the Nevi'im over and over and over again. Visions, visions, visions. That's a whole type or genre. Number three, poetry. Hallelujah. When you open Isaiah, do you see how it's broken up? It's not like a narrative section in the gospel. It's like center framed and has stanzas and everything. These are poetic forms of speech. This is a genre. Number four, autobiographical narrative. That means it's about whoever's writing it. Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord high and lifted up. This is autobiography. This is not some third person narrator saying, hey, there was this man named Isaiah and one time he had this experience. This is an autobiographical narrative. Many of the call narratives like Jeremiah 1, Ezekiel 1, Isaiah 6, the calls of these prophets are not from a third person saying, hey, I heard a story about when Ezekiel was called. It's Ezekiel saying, I'm seeing these spinning chariots and wheels and all this kind of esoteric stuff, and God grabbed me, and he picked me up, and he called me. It's, it's Isaiah saying, God burned my mouth with a coal. I mean, we, we romanticize that. How many of you want fire on your mouth that burns you? I mean, that's... Jeremiah, how many of you want... You understand that when Jeremiah said... Your words are like fire shut up in my bones. That was not a good thing. We were like, oh, we just want the word of God like fire in our bones and we just can't contain. Context. Jeremiah is saying, I don't want to say these mean things that God keeps telling me to say and it's killing me on the inside. But every time I don't say it, I'm dying on the inside. It's burning me alive. I have to say it. He's not saying, man, I'm fired up to say this message. I, I've really been stewing all week in the prayer closet. This thing's like fire shut up in my bones. This, nope. Everything I say is miserable, and I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I'm just sitting around crying all the time. But every time I don't say it, my insides are turned on fire until I do. A text without context is a... Number five. It's like number four, but it's biographical narrative. That means somebody else is telling a story that took place. There's a narrator who's explaining what's going on, what's happening, what's taking place. Now, let me deal with, we're just going to deal with oracles. This is the main type the main genre in the prophetic literature. There are two kinds of oracles, and in those two kinds of oracles, there are sub-oracles. So don't write these too closely. I'm going to start with the first one, then leave some space. The first type of oracle is an oracle of judgment. Let me just put of right there. <laughs> An oracle of judgment. This is most of the prophets. 
are oracles of judgment, meaning Torah, Torah, Torah. You won't listen to it. You won't obey it. I'm pleading with you. Get back in line with Torah. Judgment is coming if you don't. People say, get these doomsday prophets out of here. We're tired of this bad news. Give us somebody who encourages us. Give us somebody who makes us feel like God loves us and is just happy with us all the time and is just pleased with us. Give us somebody who stops saying warning. I think of, uh, what, what is that? The, it left me, so I'm not even going to try. Anyway, the subtypes of oracles of judgment are covenant lawsuit. And in these oracles, when you see or when you read these oracles, there is imagery like Yahweh is in a courtroom bringing judgment to his people because they won't listen. They won't obey. They won't get in line. An example of this is Isaiah 50, 1 through 3. Let me just jot that down. Isaiah 50, 1 through 3. And he'll say things like, this is what I have against you. Like they're in a court of law. This is something, this is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or to which of my creditors did I sell you because of your sins were you? So, and he, he begins almost to litigate them based on the law of God, Torah. There's language that sounds like a courtroom in a covenant lawsuit oracle. There are woe oracles. An example of a woe oracle is in Micah 2, 1 through 4. And guess what it starts with? Woe. Woe. Woe to you for doing this. Woe to you for disobeying Torah. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to plot evil. At morning's light, they carry it out. They covet fields. They seize them. Thus says the Lord, I am planning disaster against this people. This is a woe oracle. You're doing this that Torah prohibits. You know what the consequences of that are. Because you won't repent and get into agreement with Torah, judgment's coming. Woe oracle. Third and final oracle of judgment is a disputation oracle. And an example of a disputation oracle is Malachi 1, 2 through 5. And in a disputation oracle, there is a dispute. There is a conversation that's happening in a dialogue format where God or the prophet are asking the people a question and they respond and then God responds and there's a dispute. And it's an oracle of judgment because they're disputing with God trying to prove themselves innocent but are in fact guilty of Torah disobedience. That's a disputation oracle. Now there is the second kind of oracle which Oracles of hope. Amen. There are less oracles of hope than there are oracles of judgment, but there are oracles of hope. These are known as oracles of restoration, promise, salvation, comfort, future renewal, divine blessing, a future of plenty. They contain what is known as restoration theology. Which means this is the whole of the prophets. Okay? You will not listen to Torah. You are unfaithful to it. I am warning you of impending judgment if you do not repent. If you do not repent, these will be the outcomes. You will be exiled from your land. You will be taken away. Your cities will be burned. Your family, some of them will be killed and dragged off into a foreign land by people of a foreign nation and 
foreign tongues. Oracles of judgment. But there are always oracles of hope, which look to the other side of exile. God says, even though you refuse to repent, I still have restoration in store for you. That's still my plan for you. There is still hope. Even if you are so wicked and evil that it takes you getting your family members getting killed and dragged off into a foreign land, even if it takes all that, I'm still willing to bring you back home, restore the land, rebuild the temple, and bring back the former glory greater than it was before. Oracles of hope. This is Amos 9, 11 through 13. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches. He goes on to say in Amos 9, 13, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine and the hills shall flow to it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They'll plant vineyards and drink their wine and make their gardens and eat their fruit. I'll plant them on their land. They shall never again be uprooted out of the land I've given to them, says the Lord. So God is saying through oracles of judgment in the prophets, if you don't get an agreement with Torah, you're getting out of the land. But even if judgment happens, I want you to know there's still hope of good news and restoration. I can still bring you back into the land and restore you to an even greater degree than you were before. This is good news. This is the prophets. Now, what's on, and I'm going to erase this side because I'm going to come back to it. I'm going to give you a timeline, okay? You do not need to write this all down. I have a photocopy that if you want this, I can email it to you. And it's even more detailed than the one I have written up here. I'm saying I would rather you just listen to me walk through this than try to copy it because I have a copy of it that will be even better and you may not be able to see certain words and certain things. So just if you want this afterwards... Um, I can send an email, a photocopy. Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready online? Okay. This is going to make the Bible make sense for everyone who's ever been confused about the Old Testament and had no idea what's happening where and who's going what. And I'm going to just slide this over for two seconds so that you can see that. Okay, I'm going to get a drink of water because I'm going to run all over this building by the time I'm finished with this chart. Okay, this right here is going to unlock every time you read the Bible from this point forward. You're going to understand it. I have said, now, in my defense, pastorally, I've said all of this at some point in sermons, but it's different when you see it than when you hear it. Okay, in the Old Testament, I'm not going to go all the way back to creation. We have the united monarchy. That means that the kingdom of Israel was united under Saul, David, and Solomon. The history of the events of the kingdom transpire in 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings. 1st and 2nd Chronicles are a post-exilic dealing with the historical events that happened in First and Second Kings to build morale for the community while they rebuild the city. Okay, that's why you don't have all of Daniel's uh, Daniel, all of David's terrible sins in Chronicles, and you just have his victories because they want the community to be inspired by his good things, not his bad things. Kings just runs them through the mud. He's just making mistakes everywhere because it was written as a an historical account of what's taking place where Chronicles had a theological purpose of building morale. Okay, I can't get into all that because this is about the prophets. United monarchy happens 1050 to 931 BC. God had promised to give the kingdom to the line of David that it would never leave in covenant agreement. And that happened with Solomon, but Solomon's heart became turned and he went after, because he was created this harem of a thousand women that he was connected with, 
and in love with or in lust with one or the other. So in that sense, he began to go after the gods of all of his wives who had foreign false gods. And as judgment, God divided the kingdom because of what he did in abandoning fidelity to Yahweh. At 931 B.C., you have the kingdom, united kingdom of Israel split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The north, this is why Samaritans and Jews didn't like each other. Okay? The northern kingdom of Israel, capital Samaria. Southern kingdom of Judah, capital Jerusalem. Temples here. You know John 4, well we worship here and you worship here and where do we worship? This is what's happening historically. Israel is in much worse shape spiritually than Judah at this point. They're having many, many, many more problems. Jonah was sent as a prophet to the Assyrian Empire who God was raising up to destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. Jonah was a racist toward the Assyrians and did not want to go because they were threatening to kill the Israelites. That's why Jonah didn't want to go minister. He didn't want God to forgive them. But God is unique in that He's not only gracious to the Jewish people, but He'll even be gracious to the people who hated the Jewish people. What kind of God is one of grace in the Old Testament? There it is, folks. Jonah, Amos, and Hosea were all ministering to the northern kingdom of Israel, warning of what God would do through the Assyrian Empire. This is Neo-Assyrian. It's the new Assyrian Empire. And what would happen if they did not repent? Now, 2 Kings 17 details for us what happened in 722-721 B.C. Because they did not listen to the voice of the prophets, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea, God sent the Assyrian Empire to utterly destroy the northern kingdom of Israel and take them off into exile. This period represents the Assyrian exile. What happened, how you got Samaritans are the Jewish people in northern Israel were marrying the Assyrians and having babies. So the southern kingdom especially hated them because they destroyed part of their land and then they went and married them and, and started worshiping their false gods. Okay, Assyrian exile, 722 B.C. The kingdom remained divided from 931 to 586. The southern kingdom down here is cruising along. They're not perfect, but they're doing better than the northern kingdom of Israel. And they're watching what's happening here with the Assyrians coming and wiping out the northern kingdom of Israel. And the southern kingdom of Judah starts doing the same thing that the northern kingdom of Israel is doing. They start doing the exact same thing and said, we're different. We're, God really likes us. We've got the temple here. They didn't have the temple. We have the temple. This is Jeremiah 7. We've got the worship. We've got the sacrifices. We've got, it. We've got it covered. We're fine. We're different than them. It doesn't matter if we do the same things. Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Ezekiel all were crying out and saying, Judah... Listen, don't go down this path. Torah, Torah, Torah. They disobeyed Torah, and look what happened to them. You cannot be so arrogant to think that you can keep disobeying. God is trying to be gracious. Look at how he's been gracious. Here's the Assyrian exile. Here we're still fine, we're still fine. God's warning, warning, warning. He raises up the Neo-Babylonian Empire in 605 B.C. to 539. In 605, the Babylonian Empire overtook the Assyrian Empire as the world power. Just like how we have powers in, in our world today, how we have Russia and China and the United States. There were world powers back then too. God raised up Babylon. And guess what Babylon did? Babylon did to the southern kingdom 
in a greater devastation than this one. 586 B.C. is like the everything you thought you knew got blown to shreds. Your whole theology got burned up in front of you. Their whole theology was based on we have the temple, we have the sacrifices, nothing that we do. We're God's chosen. We're His elect. Nothing we could do could harm us. He likes us way better than the Babylonians and the Assyrians. We're His favorite. He would never do anything to us. He's proud of us. We're His children. We're the seed of Abraham. All these other nations are terrible compared to us. And the prophets are saying, Torah, Torah, you're not obeying it. He told you what would happen. Babylonian exile. This is the big one. 587, 586 B.C. This is detailed in 2 Kings 25. So Kings is detailing the events that are happening historically. And the prophets are talking about what is going on and what God is saying in the midst of those events. Okay. Babylonian exile, 586 to 536 B.C. That's why the, the time period that they're fully immersed there in Babylon. Then, as you know, we have this book called Daniel that we're working through that's happening during this period while they're in Babylon. And what is part of that restoration theology that there's coming a time where God will restore his people and restore his land? God says there's still hope. So he raises up prophets to speak to this restoration and these promises. Isaiah, even though he's dealing here in oracles of judgment, he's including oracles of hope. We've got Zephaniah who's giving some hope. We've got Ezekiel who's giving some hope. Uh, Ezekiel 37, anybody heard of that? Valley of dry bones. I'll raise them up again. Breathe life into them. Grasp the text in their town before you apply it to yours. So this is what's going on here. I'm trying to weave together some themes here. Daniel, Haggai, Zechariah has an E. Zechariah, Joel, Malachi, or my favorite is Malachi. (laughs) Uh, Oh boy, I digress. They function in the restoration post-exilic period. That means after the exile, God raised up the Persian Empire, King Cyrus, to come and overthrow Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, and say, we're getting you out of exile, we're sending you back home, and we're paying for it. Wow. So then these prophets are raised up and begin to minister. But guess what happens when you get back? So you think people would learn lessons in life, but normally they don't. Normally I don't. Normally you don't. It's, we, we try to, and then we, then we fail. What do they start doing right when they get, we're home, God loves us, let's worship false idols. In fact, let's just let God's temple be in ruins and let's go build some homes again. I'm tired of living in slave quarters in exile. I want me a big old mansion. I want me a big old house with cedar and panels, nice roof. God raises up prophets. Why are you dwelling in all these nice homes while my house is in ruins? You would think that after I paid for you to get back out, was gracious to keep you alive during that, you'd come home and want to worship me. But you're still far away from me. Come back home. And I will restore to you the years that the locust ate up. Joel 2. Restoration theology. I'll restore it. Malachi, don't hold back your finances, and all of your livelihood and keep it to yourself. Bring it to my house. Build my house. Give to my house. Support the ministry so that we can get back on Torah obedience track. We can get back to true and faithful worship. And then the Greek Empire in 331 and Alexander the Great and the Seleucians and Antioch of Epiphanes and then the Romans. Okay, I don't have time to deal with all of this. This is months worth. This is going to help you understand what in the world. Have you ever wondered, who are these people talking to? When did this happen? Where does it contextually fall? This right here is the roadmap to understand 
And I have a beautiful, look at this, beautiful. And I've got a digital copy of it. This is my only copy. This stays in my office. I brought it out here for show and tell. I have this beautiful little map that I, I'm going to give to you for the price of zero dollars. I'm just going to send it to you, and it's going to be a blessing. So anyway, if you're watching this master class and you want a copy of this, just email info at reflection.church. We'll give you a copy. It'll happen. So that right there is going to help you understand the context of the prophets, the Nevi'im, the former, the latter, the major, the minor, what's happening when, what in the world's going on historically, who, what is God doing, what is history? No, it's just this goofy sign. No, 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 it's linear. It's moving towards something. History's moving towards something. God's raising up and tearing down people to move history to a point and a purpose and a goal and an aim, namely the establishment fully of his kingdom in the earth. That does not mean there are not repetitive cycles, but it's not stuck. It's, it's moving. I said the other day, it's, it's almost like these circles moving in this direction, spiraling in a linear fashion where there are some repetitive cycles that take place, but it's moving linearly toward God's full purpose and plan. Okay, I'm moving this back here. So there is a copy of this, and I'm not going to erase. This is too painful to erase. I had a moment in here earlier today with this chart just reminding me of all the times I've used that chart and how it's blessed me. I mean that, how it's blessed me in my study of the Bible. It's... And I pray it blesses you because it just opens up so, so much understanding and context. Okay, I've got 27 minutes, and I'm going to deal with the rest of the Old Testament, which isn't much, by the way. We just dealt with uh, over 30 books right there. Again, overview. You can't deal with each one individually. We will, in the future, go through more in-depth sections of the Bible if that's something you guys would ever be interested in again. Okay. Next, instead of the Nevi'im, remember the Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. The Ketuvim or the, or the writings. The Ketuvim or the writings. This includes Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, which is fascinating. You won't find the name of God in it. God's all over it. Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Chronicles. These are writings. Torah, prophets, and writings. Instruction, prophets, and writings. Good teaching was highly valued in the ancient Near East. I'm going to give an, uh, an acronym for that. It's A-N-E. A and E, ancient Near East. Because I don't want to say ancient Near East every single time from this point out, so it's the A and E. You know what I'm talking about. The ancient Near East. They good teaching and wisdom was highly valued in the A and E. Much teaching was done at home. It's still a good practice, by the way. As a family, it's still good to learn together. It's good to grow together. Education was never meant to just solely be farmed out to someone else. The home is an important place of instruction. I'm with your family teaching one hour of 168 a week. You're with your family's 167 hours. Some of that sleeping, I get that, but teaching, instruction, wisdom, highly valued in the home context. In antiquity, some children went to scribal schools, some had more formal education, but many of them learned at home. And Hebrew wisdom was 
different and Hebrew writings were different from the A&E because they were monotheistic. They acknowledged the one true God and none others. They denied materialism and polytheism and everything else that the ancient world celebrated. Hebrew wisdom rejected. It was different and unique amongst all the ancient world. Let me tell you some literary characteristics. This is really going to help you. Some literary characteristics, in, in specifically in Hebrew poetry, you have to understand in poetry in the English language is particularly focused on rhyme, rhythm, and meter. I'm not going to try to give an example of a rhyming poem because when you try to do that, you just flop and you tend to not do well. So I'm not going to do that, but you understand what I'm saying. There's, it matters how a word ends and how the next line rhymes that sound phrase or ending of the word, that's the way that poetry is primarily done in the English language. There are other forms like limericks and haikus and things like that, but primarily it's about rhyme, meter, and rhythm. In antiquity, that was not nearly as important in describing and defining poetry. It's what one scholar termed parallelism, and I'm going to deal with the three different types here, that was important. Synonymous parallelism. I misspelled that. There we go. Synonymous. It's in their writing and just. Synonymous parallelism is when the same idea is expressed in the first line and is repeated in the second line, but said in a different way. Let me give you an example. Write this down, Psalm 33, 10 through 11. This is going to help you understand Hebrew poetry, especially Psalms. Synonymous parallelism. Here's Psalm 33, 10 through 11. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. That means that there's a same idea expressed in the second line as the first line. Here's the first line. The Lord brings the counsel of nations to nothing. Second line, he frustrates the plans of people. That's the same thing as saying the Lord brings the counsel of the plans to nothing. He frustrates their plans, doesn't let them come through. It's saying the same thing in a different way. So in Hebrew poetry, you'll see synonymous parallelism over and over again, where the first line will say something, the second line will reinforce what the first line is saying by saying it in a different way, but saying the same concept. In verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. Okay? Okay. Here's second line, the thoughts of his heart to all generations, saying the same thing. The counsel, his counsel is eternal. His thoughts are throughout every single generation. It's just developing the thought in a way that is reinforcing it with a different image or metaphor, but saying the same thing, synonymous parallelism. So when you're looking at Hebrew poetry, you're not thinking about, does this last word rhyme with the next line's last word? You're thinking parallelism. How does the next line in, engage with the line before it. Is it saying the same thing? Is it, that would be synonymous parallelism. The second type of parallelism is antithetic. Antithetic parallelism. An example of this is Psalm 30. Verse 5. Psalm 30, verse 5, which says, 
For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. The second line is contrasting and different from the concept or idea in the first line. The first line is communicating something, and the second line is saying, here is a different facet that is totally different. His anger is a moment, favor is a lifetime. These are contrasting. Weeping in the night, joy in the morning. Contrasting. This is antithetic parallelism. So this is a way you can look at the text and see what's being communicated in Hebrew poetry. Third is synthetic. It does not mean fake. Synthetic parallelism. People online are laughing. Okay, synthetic parallelism. As a doe longs for running streams, so my soul longs for you. Under this category, the second line does not repeat or it does not develop or contrast the first line. So in synonymous parallelism, the first line and the second line are saying the same thing. In antithetic parallelism, the first and second line are saying different things. In synthetic parallelism, may not be connected. It may be different. It may develop in whatever way. But as a doe longs for running streams, so longs my soul for you. That's just another way to understand parallelism in Hebrew poetry. These are the three kinds that are primary throughout the Hebrew Bible. Okay. Wisdom literature. Let me give you a little bit more information. That's literary characteristics. Let me tell you the life situation and genre of wisdom literature. And I'll erase some of this because I foresee using more of this board. That was an example of foretelling, not forthtelling. I understand that my jokes are really bad. I'm trying to get better at them since I'm a dad number two this time. So just trying to get them worse and worse for when I have our when we have our next baby. Okay. Life situation and genre of Wisdom literature. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The first thing that you need to know about wisdom literature specifically is this. It is human creativity. Responding to real life. Human creativity responding to life and life situations. Birth, death, revenge, marriage, faith, lack of faith, trust, lack of trust. This is why wisdom literature transcends any historical period and is helpful and applicable to any time period or anyone who would be willing to read. It's, they transcend the culture that's one of the reasons the Psalms are so popular. That's one of the reasons presidents quote Psalms during tragedy. Because they're real human creativity responding to life's tragedies, pains, and hurts. Now, sometimes in governmental addresses, when a president gives an address, they don't always say, hey, I'm quoting from this, but often they will allude to or quote wisdom literature because it transcends culture and history and is so applicable in whatever sphere of life you find yourself in. Because it's human creativity. Remember, the word is fully God, fully man. It's real human beings responding to life. It's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but it's real humans responding to life. The second reality of wisdom literature is that it is 
in nature. It's musical. That's why the Psalms begin with a heading to the choir master, to the sound of, in the key of, whatever it is. Much of this literature is rooted in music why there's something special about there being music playing while the Bible is read. That's why I love having Lucky or Whitney or whoever playing behind me because that's something that was very common in antiquity, that there would be a musical instrument playing in conjunction with the Scripture being read. This helps the liturgical use, meaning when it's used in public worship, When there's music and words, it helps people remember. It's like a song. I can teach you this chart, but if I came up with a song to this chart, you would remember the song much better than you would remember the chart. Why? Because music aids in the passing on of information, the passing down of information. Number three. Various genres poetry. Various genres of poetry. Historical anthologies, victory songs, curses, funeral songs, eulogies, wisdom, hymns, songs of trust, thanksgiving poems, laments, penitential poems, songs of litigation, love poems, wedding songs, predictive poetry, all kinds of poetry again and again and again. You'll see it again and again. And not only various, but it's diverse as well. Diverse and various. So the wisdom literature, the life situation, the responding to human creativity, to the situations of life, it's musical in nature. There's diverse forms of poetry. And this is the this is my landing spot here. I want to deal with the idea this is an act of God that has taken place in your midst. We have gone through 34 books of the Bible in less than 90 minutes. The idea of wisdom. And again, these are themes you're going to find in categories. The idea of wisdom. Next week will be gospels final week will be the epistles. So we'll be in New Testament, gospels, and then epistles. The idea of wisdom. And I may not write these down just for the sake of time. Wisdom is defined as the accumulated knowledge or of experience and observation that can be taught to succeeding generations. Wisdom is accumulated knowledge of experience. Not just head knowledge, it's experiential knowledge that's accumulated. And observation means you look out at the world and see how things happen. That can be taught to the next generation. Wisdom was different in the Hebrew culture because, as I mentioned and alluded to earlier, with Hebrew education, monotheism and the fear of the Lord is directly connected to the idea of wisdom. What is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. This is Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. That means if you do not have the fear of the Lord, you cannot be wise. I did not say you cannot be smart. You cannot be, I don't care how much you know. If you do not have the fear of the Lord, it is biblically impossible to be wise. I did not say you don't have experience. I did not say you do not have knowledge. It is impossible to have God's kind of wisdom if you do not have the fear of the Lord. You can be intelligent, you can be smart cannot have God's kind of wisdom without the fear of the Lord. It is the only path to wisdom. There is no other path to wisdom other than the fear of the Lord. It is the beginning. So if you skip the beginning, you don't have an entry point. This is not 
something that is uh, up for discussion or debate or like, well, there probably is another way. This is just biblical reality that it is a narrow way to wisdom, and that way is through the fear of the Lord. Why is that the way? Because God is the dispenser of wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives it. So if you don't have reverential awe and fear of God and reverence for him, how in the world are you going to receive wisdom from him if you think you're more intelligent than he is? I digress. The idea of wisdom is connected to the fear of the Lord. Can't have it without the fear of the Lord. This is the wisdom literature, the writings, the Psalms, the Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, it, we can go on and on. I'm not going to list every one of them. That's the Ketuvim, the writings. I tell you, that's the fear of the Lord. There, there's also the form of wisdom. Wisdom is personified in the Old Testament. As a female itinerant preacher who stands out at the city and screams at people. Not in the negative sense. Heralds. Cries out, yells, screams out. Listen to me. Follow my path. That's what, how wisdom's personified in the Old Testament. As a female preacher crying out on the streets, listen to my words. Hear. Hear what I'm saying. Wisdom was also dispensed through a sage or a wise person. Wisdom is taught as a practical exposition of, you guessed it, Torah. So someone who's wise in the Old Testament who would be giving wisdom would be somebody who is applying Torah to their life. The application of Torah to one's life. You had priests, prophets, sages, kings. The sages were ones, the wise ones in the land, who had grasp of Torah and its application in life. That's what wisdom was. Priests are dealing with standing on behalf of people to God because of their breaking of Torah. Prophets are standing on behalf of God to people telling them how to engage Torah. Everything flows from Torah in the Old Testament. The philo philosophical and speculative and even pessimistic wisdom found in Ecclesiastes and Job, we're talking about the form of wisdom, demonstrate the emptiness and folly of the search for insight apart from God. Let me tell you why. In Job, you find speeches from friends. Those speeches do not represent the way God thinks about a topic. So you can't say, well, it's in the Bible, that's what God thinks. Yeah, and the Pharisees said he was a blasphemer. That's not what God says about Jesus. So just because somebody said something in the Bible does not mean it's divine revelation of the nature of God. The false prophets mocked Yahweh. That doesn't mean that Yahweh's not real. Job's three friends offered wisdom, but it was wrong. There came a final conversation partner, Elihu, who began to get more in the vein of real godly wisdom. But ultimately, it wasn't until God showed up and spoke for himself that the full measure of wisdom could be grasped and understood. In fact, what God said, in many senses, undid what his friends said. Because God is the one who holds wisdom. Each of the speakers may present a perspective that has some kind of wisdom or some kind of advice, but none of them offer the final perspective. It's God in Job who offers the final perspective. So you can't read the advice of one of Job's friends and say, well, this is what I need to do for my life, and this is what God wants from me, and then not listen to what God said about it. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So you have to, again, understand 
the poetry in interpretation and the narrative flow and what's being communicated before you just begin to adopt things that you're reading in poetry. Let's also look at Ecclesiastes. Talked about the book of Job. Let's talk briefly about Ecclesiastes because this is the form of wisdom. We have a different form of wisdom that we get. You have to understand Ecclesiastes has two primary speakers. The first is a, a narrator who opens and closes, and the middle is the coelet or the teacher who's describing their experience of life and what they're sensing, what they're experiencing. But even though I showed you the interpretive journey, when you get to Job and when you get to Ecclesiastes and when you get to Proverbs and when you get to Psalms, I love the five-step journey, but did you know there is an even better way to interpret the Old Testament? It's called the way Jesus did. When Jesus took the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Along with him, he showed him himself in the scriptures. So one of the greatest practices you can do in the depths of your Old Testament reading is finding where Jesus is present and how the text is ultimately pointing to Jesus. The first, un, uh, the first portion of Ecclesiastes and then the bookend, the second unnamed wise teacher gives a cautious approval to Coalette's words. And when you think about what Coalette says in Ecclesiastes specifically, he's talking about the vanity, meaningless, and pointlessness of life over and over and over again. Vanity, vanity, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. I'm not going to get into all the Hebrew terms of what's described there. I don't have time. But under the sun is a euphemistic phrase for that can literally be understood as life without God. The main complaint that Job and the book of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs and many of the complaints within poetic literature in the Old Testament are resolved in the life of ministry of Jesus. What do I mean by that? I mean that living and then dying and it all being pointless is undone by Jesus' life. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. So Coalette's main disappointment with life is that we just do all this and die. What's the point? We're all going to die. And Jesus comes along, John 11, and says, I am the resurrection and the life. You'll never die. You'll live forever if you believe in me. So if you read back into Job, because Job is, how in the world am I good and bad, and bad things are happening? It's undoing what would be called Deuteronomistic theology and he's not understanding, I did good things, God's not blessing me, I'm getting harmed, why is this happening? Job is a wrestling with that. Ecclesiastes is wrestling with what seems meaningless with life under the sun or without God, but the narrator concludes at the end of Ecclesiastes and says this is the aim, to fear God and to keep His commands. If you do that, you have experienced life. So the narrator bookends... Colette's words. In Job, the three friends are bookended by the narrator whose voice ends up being God himself near the end of Job. And so in poetic literature and in wisdom literature, you have to understand the form of wisdom that's being given. It may be a proverb. It may be a story. It may be an experience. It may be about human creativity responding to life. But interpretively, we have to understand in the Old Testament, what does the rest of the biblical map say? Step four. How does the remainder of Scripture address this? Now, specifically, as New Testament believers, how does New Testament address this? Well, I know that the despair that Job was feeling was real. We've all had despair in that sense where we feel like things are happening and we didn't do anything to deserve it necessarily. Felt like we were doing the right thing. We've had experiences like Job. We've had experiences like the Coalette who said, man, I, I just feel like what I'm, what I'm, I'm just kind of wandering around. It's, what's the point in life? Everybody's had that moment at some point. Or another. 
Is there a point in my existence? Is there a point in me being here? But here's the beauty of the interpreting the Old Testament passage in consult with the entire biblical map is that now Christ himself subjected himself to humanity and to death and to the curse of sin so that that curse and meaninglessness and lack of purpose in life would be removed. The veil of that would be removed and the fulfillment of life restored and its creativity and its beauty and its experience is all restored through Jesus. So the despair and hopelessness that can sometimes be seen in the Old Testament, we have to also understand interpreting it through the lens of the entire biblical map. We have Proverbs. These are sayings, and I'm going to conclude here in just a minute. Proverbs, they're brief sayings about observed realities that have borne out across generations. These have been observed. These have been measured. They're grounded in experience. They arise from observation. They're expressed in a memorable uh, form. They're short. They're pithy. They're terse. They're memorable. You can quote them and remember them and apply them because they're intended to be passed down in short little nuggets of wisdom. Proverbs. There's a practice Two more things. The practice of wisdom. The practice of wisdom, which all of the wisdom literature communicates the same reality. There are two paths. There's the narrow and wise path, and there's the broad and unwise path. There are only two paths. People think there are so many options in this life. There's only really two. There's a narrow gate, in a narrow way that leads to life. This is Matthew 7. Jesus is the wise and good teacher who knows all. There's the narrow gate that leads to life, and there's the broad way that leads to destruction. And few even find the narrow gate. I didn't say few stay on the gate. I said few people even find the narrow gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And few people even find that way. This is sobering. The final thing is the person of wisdom. As I mentioned, wisdom is personified in the Old Testament. There's a female preacher crying out in the streets, don't do this. Be wise. Don't follow in the folly of this decision. You'll see this over and over and over again in wisdom literature and in the Proverbs. But the person of wisdom is ultimately the pre-incarnate Christ and then Christ incarnate. Colossians 1 says that He was the one who was in the beginning and that all things were formed through Him. He is the master architect of creation. So ultimately, when we look back through the biblical map in the steps of grasping the text in their town and measuring the width of, width of the river to cross and creating a theological principle and then uh, seeing and consulting the biblical map and then grasping the text in our town, when we look back through the lens of, or look back at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, it, it's amazing how things begin to open up. The Old Testament what is concealed there is revealed in the New Testament. So we have an itinerant, unnamed, female form of wisdom that's screaming out, especially to all the young and goofy males who are making terrible decisions, this wise, motherly figures saying, don't do that, don't ruin your life, don't fall into that temptation, don't go in this direction. That's, a lot. that's Proverbs 1-7 through right there. Um, but in the New Testament, when we look back, we see that the person of wisdom is the Lord Jesus. And that when we build our life on His teachings, we're like someone who doesn't build their house on the sand, but who builds their house on the rock. 
when the storms came, when the winds blew, when the waters raged, there was a great fall that happened for one house, but for the other it was not moved. They were not moved. That's the reality of wisdom. So just briefly, prophets, what's happening here in the prophets? They're rooted in a historical reality. They're in context historically. They're speaking to events that are happening. Oracles of judgment with the promise of future hope. The sages or the wisdom, they're coming alongside and writing during these periods and taking principles from Torah and saying these are applicable things that we've learned that if you do these things, you're not going to end up in exile. They're not claiming like the prophets, I have a message from God to you. They're saying, look, I watched what happened in Israel. I saw this. If you do this kind of behavior, these are the things that happen. Be wise. Obey the commands of the Lord. If you don't, harm may befall you. They're saying this in this period to these people as sayings of wisdom. And these things are observable throughout history and repeated through kind of a short and memorable term. So that's the prophet's. And the writings, in a nutshell, and in an overview, I pray that that helps you understand how in the world 34 other books in the Old Testament deal with Torah, the first five books, and then how that leads us into a historical period of Roman Empire coming and the life of Jesus in the Gospels next week. Have a great night. Have a great time this week looking through this chart. Remember, if you want this chart, email info at reflection.church. We will send you the chart.